this week we are covering seating and posture for people with Huntington's disease. Okay, so I'm hoping we can see the first slide. Uh, yes, here we go. Okay, this is a very brief slide. I think we did one in um, a previous manual handling session and uh, I just swamped everyone with information. So we just decided to break it down. So this is for a person living at home. Okay, now this covers both wheelchair and this covers seating, specialist seating, not standard seating, specialist seating. So I'll begin with wheelchair first. Okay, wheelchair services, they are statutory services. You should not have to pay for a wheelchair if you make or if a person, a healthcare professional makes a referral to a wheelchair service for you or on behalf of your loved one. Now, you can, there are very strict referral criteria and usually wheelchair services are, um, they usually will only provide wheelchairs when that individual is um, transitioning to immobility or falling frequently. Um, they will not provide wheelchairs for what they call social use only. It's really important to know the criteria um, and to get familiar with that. And you can do that via your GP, you can do it via physiotherapy, you can do it via occupational therapy. Okay. Now, there are various different types of wheelchairs. And so there are standard wheelchairs, which don't have much postural support in them, but they will come with perhaps a lap belt. And that can be, they can be, um, they're not designed to um, be used in lieu of a chair. So therefore you need to be careful with regards to that and comfort. Um, they also aren't particularly robust. Um, so you need to think about all of those kinds of things. And you also need to then, if you are going that way, start to think about, okay, how am I gonna get this chair in and out of the house? And again, or in and out of a car, Again, an occupational therapist should be able to advise you on, for example, ramps or um, applying to um, uh, different kinds of mobility schemes that are out there for altering the car, for example. OK, and again, there are for ramps and things like that. Again, your occupational therapist should be able to direct you and help you out with those types of things um, and see you through that process. And the same is also true for um, mobility and car mobility and should be able to advise you on grants, although most car providers are pretty good and are clued in on that. Um, those kinds of things are also linked in uh, with PIP and whether you have the upper mobility rate. So again, make sure that you're aware of all of the little uh, bits, if you like, that go around wheelchairs. Um, Non-standard wheelchairs um, are chairs that tilt in space um, and they also have postural support and they also have pressure leave, relieving support. And again, there should be no cost for those, okay? It should be for, via your wheelchair services. And again, be physiotherapy, GP or occupational therapy. They become quite bulky and that's when you will need to consider your house, getting in and out of the house, servicing, so on and so forth, and cars. Um, now, I was just having a thought and it was on the tip of my tongue about wheelchairs, but it's disappeared, so I'll come back to it. Um, with regards to seating, so this is a, not a wheelchair. This is a chair which supports an individual with Huntington's disease. This is where the funding gets really, really tricky. Um, OK, and it also depends on where you live. So I'm based in Birmingham. And for me, I can actually apply to the local authority, to Birmingham City Council's equipment service and potentially get good 
specialist seating for an individual with Huntington's disease so that there is no cost. So you need to find out what your local services offer in terms of that, because I know across the border, for example, actually um, local authority do not provide access to specialist chairs. Um, and then people end up purchasing their own or perhaps purchasing inappropriately. Um, so it's really important you find out who delivers what in your local area. And again, an occupational therapist will know about that. So if it's not funded by local authority equipment services, which by the way, should be free to you, then it's about, okay, right, how do we do this? So I would suggest the next stage is to have continuing healthcare assessment, because chances are, if your loved one needs specialist seating, chances are they also have other needs that might meet continue, what's called continuing healthcare criteria. Problem is, is that actually um, the criteria for continuing healthcare and meeting it seem to be getting higher and higher and higher. And so you need a good level of evidence. And that's where we get back to engaging with physiotherapy, engaging with other processes so you can get those layers of evidence. So you get to the point where hopefully you qualify for continuing healthcare and therefore the equipment, the specialist equipment, particularly specialist seating, specialist beds can be purchased through a health budget. But sometimes again, you might actually just have specialist seating or specialist um, uh, bed requirements or, or other equipment requirements, but perhaps you don't have any other healthcare domains. I would suggest that your occupational therapist or your healthcare professional is looking towards applying for what's called an individual funding request, sometimes known as an individual exceptional funding request. And that is from your local uh, commissioning group, also known as um, health authority and chairs, funding for chairs can come through that. OK, but again, it's about layers of evidence. So it can't be provided through this. What have you tried? It can't be provided through continuing healthcare. OK, but there's still a need. There's still a clinical need. It's not a choice. This person needs this to function. So therefore go down that route. And health, Kirsty has also put on here things such as personal health budget. Um, again, that sort of personal health budget that um, comes from, has a person um, been in hospital and therefore um, that continuing healthcare budget or that 117, which you might have heard of, which is when somebody is their care is funded after they've been under the Mental Health Act section in hospital. So it can, there are lots of ways into this. Now there's somebody asking a question here. Um, have someone on CHC and CCG have said they won't fund chair as it is not bespoke, um, as not specifically made for the person. My goodness. Alex. Okay, that's Di right there. Sorry, Alex. Di. Well, while you answer that question, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen because I'm, I just need to change something on the presentation. So <laughs> okay. Don't panic when I disappear. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to answer it live on there because I think it needs a good discussion with Di, actually. So, but it's really important that people know that actually um, continuing healthcare and CCGs um, can actually become and I'm sorry to say this a little bit argumentative um, and that's where you need really really good advice and you need to appeal and you need to demonstrate that this is clinical okay Dice saying chat soonish great <laughs> okay um, so where were we on funding so um, social services CHC individual funding request um, personal health budgets. Again, an occupational therapist, physiotherapist, depending on the setting that they're working in, should be able to guide you through that. And as you've also seen, um, our colleagues um, 
in the HDA also know about these things. I think that's everything that was on your slide. Right, sorry, um, I'm gonna try it again. <laughs> no, okay. Okay. I mean, Kirsty's put charity on here, but you know what? I think all of these other things need to be tried before you ever go near charities because charities, um, their pockets have been drained dry. And actually, if it should be, it, if it's a clinical need, it should be provided through social care or health, particularly if it's having an impact on that person's quality of life, risk, skin, etc. Are we having a bit of a technical moment? I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have done it. Um, here we go. Um, Kirsty's next slide that she's putting up is um, about funding for seating living in care. So I've just spoken about funding for seating living in the community. Kirst, do you want to talk about this or shall I say that actually I'll just continue? But mm -hmm. actually, okay, so when a person enters care, the rules are slightly different, okay, because the care provider should be providing standard kit and there is what's called a nursing home contract between them and the local authority between them and the local ccg as to what they should be providing that should meet that person's needs and if it's not meeting their needs then there is a process for them to raise that and they can depending on the referrals uh, pathways in the local area they can actually refer to an occupational therapist to come in and do that assessment, or actually there might be an OT within the setting already that can guide that individual through it. But the funding's kind of still the same. Um, so if that person's needs can't be met by the nursing home contract, then through a process and layers of evidence again, an assessment, then it may very well be that actually you can apply for specific funding under continuing healthcare because that person's needs change all the time. They're not static. And then they can, and then that can be taken forward in the same way. But again, you also might want to apply for an individual funding request. And it's a really huge um, and neglected piece of work, actually, that as therapists, if we had time. I'd really like to get my head around it because um, it's so important for the person's function, so important for skin. Um, and actually there's not a huge amount in the legislation and nice guidelines around the benefits of seating. So I think we need to get a little bit more savvy about that. Um, and I've just put on there just to remind, um, you know, OTs, but actually it's useful for family members as well to use the Royal College of OT guidelines. So they're fairly recent where they've put guidelines together on what equipment and provision um, should be available in the care home environments. Um, it is incredibly complicated and I was having this conversation only yesterday. Um, I'm, I previously have worked with um, people who aren't actually living in their own health authority um, who are um, covered by continuing health care. So the system is, system is very different for me as an occupational therapist, you know, going to um, a hospital in London yesterday and working with people who actually are in their own health authority. So I'm having to, le to learn different funding streams as a, as a healthcare professional. Um, so it's incredibly difficult for families. Um, ask the questions and you know, ask the professionals to find out and care home managers, you know, ask the questions. I'm sometimes a bit cheeky in that actually, I will just say, okay, how are you gonna protect this individual? How are you going to look after them? How are you going to enable them to function? OK, you know, you've hit me with a brick wall here. Um, actually, how are you going to help me? Yeah. So and sometimes sometimes I've raised it to the CQC 
sometimes I've raised it to safeguarding um, because it's about a person's clinical needs that aren't being met. Yeah, it comes down to, yeah, duty of care and ensuring that person is, is going to be safe. You know, we're, we're talking about risk as well as comfort when it comes to seating. Okay, there's a lady here, um, Jane, and I'm really sorry to hear it, but um, she's saying that she got referred to an OT who didn't really know anything about what we're saying here. Um, so I'm kind of sorry to hear that. I do, I would suggest, Jane, that um, maybe you get in touch with the HGA, who um, <laughs> I can actually, I can actually, um, one of them's actually asked me to, to make sure I write this stuff down and I'm going to put it on my list and I'm giving, going to give it to the HTA so that maybe actually then that guidance can go out to your local OT and your local neurophysio. Yeah. I hope that's okay. Yeah, it's unfortunately it's so different in different areas. Um, and yeah, in terms of occupational therapists and it's we've we've done the clinical tips just to help signpost OTs who are working in the community and perhaps aren't working in special services so don't have the knowledge that Alex and I I have so to try and share that um, I mean Alex and I very much demonstrate the difference in knowledge depending on where you've worked as an occupational therapist but there are the information is there the yeah um, OTs can actually reach out to us and they can reach out to the HTA and I think it's important that they do and maybe Jane actually it's about saying to the local OT actually have you had a word with HTA mm. as well yeah because they're pretty savvy savvy is going to be my word of the day um but I will get something written down for sure okay so posture and seating so we were brainstorming and of course seating um happens at different times in the day so we just wanted to remind to remind ourselves of that really um if we're looking at seating um if someone you know, we, we had the question about the um from the family member who said her husband only looks comfortable in bed um so how do we get him comfortable in seating well are we thinking seating for his shower if he's having a shower or is it um in the lounge when he's um, in the in the room in the lounge review or are you thinking about outdoors you know going out in the community in which case we're looking at a wheelchair so we just wanted to put that out there but with the caveat being that the principles are going to be the same so wherever someone is seated the principles of assessment um, keeping someone safe are going to be the same okay, um, Jane is actually saying uh, in the lounge okay okay so okay okay so i'm looking just waiting for my okay so as occupational therapists if you're asking us to come in we are looking at what the problem is so um that sounds as simple as that i mean we would we'll be doing that by speaking to um, the person with huntington disease speaking to family members or carers you know, and then doing our observational assessment. But it's so important that we listen and consider what we're being told because we're only seeing a snapshot of time. Um, you know, we might be seeing the, um, someone at the best who just been hoisted and sitting out ready for our assessment. We don't know without being told what happens two hours later um, or five <laughs> hours later. Um, so our, in our assessment, we'll be looking at um, posture and presentation of posture, but also the, the function of seating as well. Um, so, for example, if someone's eating and drinking, their posture is going to be very different to coming out in the lounge and spending time watching TV or you know, sitting, reading you know, with family members risk really important and if you think about posture and seating and someone sliding for example the risk of falls is really big um, with HD and seating but that's not the only risk we'd be considering we'd be looking at um, um, function so if someone's not in a um, 
upright posture or not midline and the risk of aspiration and choking when they are eating and drinking the risk of um, them hurting themselves if there's a lot of career movements um, and pressure breakdown as well We're thinking about what kind of material the chair is made of what someone's um, skin integrity is like um, and finally, Alex has already touched on, and obviously really important, is the environment. Um, I'm really lucky. I've, um, most of my work with people with um, Huntington's disease is in a, in a hospital or a care home environment where we have nice um, fresh holds. There's no steps to go from bedroom to the lounge, even out into the garden. I can take a a um, lounge chair on wheels out into the garden because there are no no lips over the door thresholds and the board the wall the doors are wide enough to get our equipment through in the community um, the ot coming in won't just be looking at um, the person and the chair but they have to look at the wider environment moving around the house getting in out of the house as alex said if we are looking at um, providing a wheelchair can you actually get up and into the house, out of the door? Um, anything you want to add to the to the assessment? You know, what is the problem? I mean, we've had the, co the questions we've had you know, are great because they're really clear about what the problem is, but I would be asking a lot more to, to um, in, inform my assessment. Yeah, I'm gonna kind of go, I'm gonna comment on the community thing that actually, um, the environment is huge. Um, the house, the flat, the bedsit, the room. People live in all kinds of places. People live on boats. Um, so it's it's all about all of these things. So it's never usually just about the seating. It's usually about everything else. What about entrapment? What about the dog that might get in the gubbins of the chair? What about the fact that you know there's two small babies in the house? Um, where is this going to be kept? How is it going to be maintained? It's kind of all of those things. And I think people kind of go, what do you mean, send me a chair? And you're just like, well, uh, no, <laughs> actually it's a lot bigger than that. And as we've already said, because there are funding difficulties, um, often or not, it's just like, well, okay, well, you can only have one of those. Well, hold on one second, um, don't, you know, you have more than one chair. So you saying that this person is only going to have one more one chair. So and sometimes that's why I made the point that wheelchairs aren't a substitute for chairs. Wheelchairs are kind of a substitute for legs, They're not a substitute for chairs. Yeah. Chairs are chairs. And um, actually, they enable you to do a completely different function as does a bed. So, yeah, it gets a bit fighty sometimes. You know, people get frightened about what's Kirsty going to want next, but actually um, it's got to be right for the individual and at that point in time, and of course we all change regardless of Huntington's disease or not, but we know with Huntington's disease that um, the, con the condition of HD is going to deteriorate, so we might get a solution right on on day one of assessment but that doesn't mean that reassessment shouldn't happen as well and i think that's really important to that's remember. an important thing to say as well you're absolutely right that actually um in your assessment it might very well be that you're actually having to say this is going to last this individual two years because within this space of time they will have changed their posture will have changed their presentation will have changed and therefore we're going to need to look at something else um, and I think uh, providers and funders, they don't like to hear that, but I would rather tell them that rather than make out that this is the thing that's all things to all people. Yeah. And I, I think another th um, thing on that as well is um, the chairs are, can be really, um, really used, well used. So even the most busk chair, uh, I'm sure you've all got experience of um, thing, equipment with H, um, people with HD does break, does get broken, does can get bashed and battered. So, you know, equipment, a, a chair is not necessarily going to um, last 
as long as a commissioner might expect for those reasons as well yeah for that yeah yes because it's quite interesting isn't it because some products say um oh designed for huntington's disease yeah. but actually yes for only a set period of time and actually thereafter we'll need parts replacing or we'll need replacing as a whole because they've not been tested they may have been tested with people with Huntington's disease but they haven't been tested with everyone with Huntington's disease so I think again very very important that as therapists we become quite confident in saying that too yeah okay so assessment so postural changes in Huntington's disease um so, so what happens, we, we're not going to um, go into lots and lots of detail about seating, but it's really important to, to think about, particularly with people with Huntington's disease, you know, what changes affect our ability to seat them, to seat someone, and actually that person's ability to, to, to be comfortable in their seating. Do you want to run through? Shall I run through these? Yeah, if you run through them, that's great, because okay. I think that might lead, lead us on to sort of talking about um, what the uh, Scottish um, Association wanted to talk about, wasn't it? Okay. Well, that might be a little bit later on in the presentation. <laughs> so I'm going to start with um, in, um, career movements, involuntary movements. Um, because of the involuntary movements, it's really it's going to be really hard for that individual to stay in one place to stay seated um, so as occupational therapists when we're doing our seating assessment we look at the pelvis how the pelvis is um, sitting on a chair any movements in the pelvis and then we look at the arms the upper body and then we look at the legs so imagine if you've got career movements in the pelvis arms and legs person's going to be moving within their base um, so you try and sit someone on a, um, a flat base with those movements they're likely to slip so that just just a little bit of information to think about why those movements will be adding to a reason why someone is slipping in their chair um, i've also put on their stiffness and movement as as huntington disease um, progresses the, the involuntary movements can slow down and stiffness comes in. So Alex and I were saying about seating needs might change. Absolutely, they might change. And what's um, appropriate at one point in someone's um, diagnosis might not be for later. Um, so later on, when we start talking about specialist chairs, there are chairs which can be adapted over time as someone changes. I think um, an important thing to there to say is stiffness in movement, but there's also an element here of pain too. So um, a lady was asking about her husband being comfortable. Um, it might not actually just be about the seating in and of itself. It's really important that um, if your husband is under a Huntington's disease consultant or a neurologist or whoever is overseeing his care, that actually you explore pain as well, because, and it's, it's quite an underexplored area in Huntington's disease, um, but there is such a thing that is known as Huntington's disease pain, and it can be quite difficult to manage. So postural support is only one thing. Pain is a, another thing in and of itself, and that needs management, whether that be pharmacological management or perhaps it's an early starter of a contracture, which is the hypothesis. Those kinds of things need to be thought about. Mm. Yep. Um, poor sitting balance. So that um, could be down to um, postural changes, um, muscle weakness. It could be that um, tone has changed. Um, one of the things that we'd be assessing as OTs is what is someone's sitting balance with no support whatsoever? If we sit someone on, on the side of the bed and offer no support, what is someone's balance? And it might be that balance is quite good, but actually over a period of an hour, fatigue comes in and 
they're no not you know, that person's no longer able to maintain their balance. Um, that's really important to us because that gives us an indication of how much support we need to give. We don't want to give someone lots and lots of support, such as um, um, back support and tilting space if they don't need it we want the muscles to still be working so there's a, a fine balance there um the pelvis instability so the pelvis is when, when we're sitting down um what's keeping us sat do you imagine we've got the picture of the man balancing there if you are standing on one leg for too long how you become quite unstable and how tiring that is um, and then you think about in, in seating, if you can't keep your base, your pelvis um, stable and supported, it's going to be really fatiguing and you're not going to keep your balance. Um, head control, certainly as um, HD progresses, head control become, become more difficult. And that in itself has lots of, um, it raises lots of things to consider such as safety and eating and drinking, how someone is engaging in their environment, be able to look around and watch what's happening. Within the term sacral sitting and posterior pelvic tilt, um, I know that's a lot of um, words which might not mean much, but as healthcare professionals, the words that we use a lot and take for granted when we talk to each other, but really that's thinking about, if you think about yourself sat on the sofa at the beginning of the day, <laughs> and then by the evening, if you're still sat on the sofa, how you start to slouch down because you're getting fatigue and where your head might be at the top of the sofa supported is moving down and you're, you're sliding, slipping to get comfortable and you're sitting on your sacrum. So on the bone, beginning to sit on the bony part of your pelvis. So that's what we mean by that. I'm going to move on because I'm just conscious of time, Alex. Yeah, no, chin wagging forever. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, I think this is fairly, um, I think this is a, a fairly obvious slide. Um, and I think we've spoken around it already. Yeah. But good seating can provide good posture, which the person may be lacking at this particular point in their illness and going forward. So therefore, it's almost the opposite of what Kirsty has just been speaking about. And actually, good seating can provide, and, and not lots of people know about this, but can actually provide sensory feedback in order to be able to reduce some of the involuntary movements. And often or not, if you seat people in good support, you'll actually see probably after about five or 10 minutes, maybe even half an hour, that actually the movements have reduced markedly if you've got the right seating. It facilitates function, particularly with regards to engaging in the world because it's providing the support that you need, but it's also really improving um, safer eating and drinking, reducing aspiration risk, reducing risk of pressure areas, decreasing fatigue, it gets so overlooked for people with Huntington's disease. Um, we've spoken previously about eating and drinking and the importance of nutrition and calorie intake, but actually even then, even when that's optimized, it's absolutely exhausting if you're not seated properly and it promotes comfort. So this gets us back to, I guess, our lady who's talking about her hubby and comfort um so okay posture and seating yeah so. so i'm kind of like where do we start and i'm very very aware that we must all recognize that and we're going to give you where to start um I mean, where would we start as ot's but we know that ourselves we don't sit still so we're going to give you what would be the ideal but I'm not sat at the ideal right now. I've got my knees, my legs crossed because I wasn't comfortable. I've been shifting, Alex is shifting. So we're gonna look at um, and quickly cover what would be, I, I kept changing the title of the slide, you know, you know, normal seating, there isn't normal seating. So we just don't sit for long, um, but generally you know, we would like our head to be over our pelvis and our hips so if we, we're sat well my head is in line with my pelvis my hips 
and my hips are at 90, my knees aren't, one knee is, but the other one's crossed, so it's not. Um, pelvis in neutral um, and weight, I'm not sure what I mean by that. So I think I put weight there because if our pelvis isn't, um, isn't aligned, then we're going to be putting more weight through um, one bottom cheek than the other, simply. And if our weight isn't neutral, then we've got more um, potential to um, develop pressure or pressure um, ulcers, skin breakdown in that side. But you imagine if my pelvis is like that, my upper body is also going to be leaning that way. So that's why you see us talking about having the pelvis in neutral first. Um, and we're looking at feet supported and arms supported. Um, if we don't try and maintain that posture and start at that point, then we start getting postural changes and muscle changes. And that's when I mentioned about muscle tone and uh, muscles shortening. Um, and if you get to that point where someone can no longer sit with their hips at 60, um, hips at 90, sorry, then they are going to slide in their chair to get comfortable unless we are accommodating that so that's why it's really important we would both say to look at posture early on not wait until someone is uncomfortable um, and going back to the question for the husband who's only properly comfortable in bed it makes me wonder whether he can no longer get his hips at 90 or his knees at 90 and what kind of chair we're looking at putting him in in the lounge it might be that he needs a specialist chair for the lounge and not a standard chair or a standard um, a chair with um, recline, for example. That might not be appropriate either. So that's why we, we do look at starting at that, at, at that, but none of us sit like that all the time. Um, I'm going to put up a slide now just so we can visually see um, seating matters have kindly given us permission today to use um, to use this slide. And if you go onto the website, they've done a lovely case study of um, a lady whose name I've, I've forgotten now. I'm just really sorry for that. Um, um, and the OT came out and assessed her in her, it looks like a rise and recliner chair. I suspect it had back recline. Um, I looked at her posture before and then prescribed an Alanta chair. And what I really liked about this is we're not showing perfect posture. You know, we've said about being upright and um, pelvic tilt and you know, knees at 90. She looks comfortable. Um, the before and after, she looks much more comfortable. Look at her head position. She's looking up as opposed to looking down at the floor. Um, her pelvis is still tilted, but actually she's in a chair which has got a ramped seat. So that's preventing her from falling, from sliding forwards. Um, uh, I, think it, I think it's important to say that sometimes you're not gonna get perfect seating. No, and um, and sometimes right. you might not actually get seating at all. Um, I've got a gentleman that actually he can't sit up um and so therefore um we're having to work around that in the best way possible um so therefore we can't and he gets agitated when he gets put into some form of seating and there's a balance between the agitation and the increased movement and him being seated and it's almost as though everybody else wants him seated um, rather than him wanting to be seated, he's demonstrating, if you like, his communication through his agitation. Um, however, of course, we've made strenuous efforts to make sure that he's eating and drinking in the best way possible, but it's not necessarily through seating. So you might have to get a little bit creative. Yeah, yeah thank you. I just like that. I just wanted people to, to really get that visual picture of you know, the, uh, the best case scenario might not be the textbook scenario. Uh, yeah, definitely. Okay.
So we'll just really quickly go through, you know, we, we need to all need to consider when are you using the chair, how you're getting into the chair. So what Alex and I are thinking about is someone still transferring, standing, getting up, walking over to the chair, nicely sitting down or <laughs> jumping into the chair, which we've both observed. Or throwing, the, or throwing themselves backwards or actually, you know, a big part of this as well, particularly for care homes is like actually the manual handling element of it and the, that kind of thing as well. So it's about, yeah, what comes before, and what comes during and what comes after. And it might be you know, being hoisted into the chair, but that really quite nicely takes us on to the question, any suggestions for stopping the, the chair from moving backwards? I've seen this and it's really, really scary in a care home environment. If we haven't got a robust enough chair, it will move. So when I say robust, I'm thinking a, a standard, a heavy standard armchair um, for one person we had to have up against a wall. But that only worked because it had a really high headrest. If there had been no headrest on the chair and it was up against the wall, that individual would have hit their head on the wall. So it's not as simple as the crack chair, it's thinking about the whole environment as well. Um, but if a chair's moving, the other thing I've always done is when I'm looking at a specialist chair, I've always ensured that the manufacturer puts four locking caster brakes on. Some chairs as a standard will only have two casters that break, that lock, I say break, you know, that casters lock. I would always, always ask for, have every single um, brake locked to keep that chair um, secure. Alex, you talked about putting some non-stick on the floor, didn't you? But actually putting the... Yeah, the I did. I, I spoke about thinking about the flooring. I spoke about thinking about thinking about the footwear. Um, so, and there are various different products out there that you can use. Um, actually, it doesn't even have to be really, really expensive. It can actually be offcuts from linoleum. From <laughs> I've gone and blagged stuff from the local carpet right for people. Um, and certainly um, sometimes when chairs move bang up against the wall, because often you'll get people and they'll go, no, this is my favourite chair. I'm going to use it. Thank you very much. And I'm not going to have a specialist chair. It's about, OK, how can I? And let's think about what we've discussed in previous webinars about um, behaviour and behavioural change and adapting to change. You've got quite a rigid individual. Um, sometimes you have to think around that. And again, almost if you like to transition them to a point where actually they'll be accepting of something new coming in. So adapting the existing chair. Um, I had um, a lady who actually went out and saw a couple of old Chesterfields for like 40 quid and they're really, really sturdy chairs. And that actually enabled her husband to do a really heavy transfer back, really high back. And the weight of the chair didn't move. Um, and so she put it on some um, non-slip linoleum which was great but also just in case we actually put some pipe lagging on the wall behind the chair um just in case it did move and scuff the wall um so it's it's those types of um cheap fixes i suppose in the intermediate that work quite well um, and I've put on the slide, what support do you need? What I mean by that is what physical support, I've not made that very clear. So what um, structural physical support on the chair do we need? And this part of the presentation now is gonna hopefully answer the questions about um, someone sliding um, and not being comfortable in bed because all the points, sorry, not being comfortable in seating. One question was, how can I make my husband comfortable when he's seating? And the other, question was the husband he's comfortable in bed but not in the lounge so these are all things which we would consider and would potentially make someone uncomfortable so if starting what we would we would say is quite basic as occupational therapists is looking at the seat the width the length and the height so for example if a seat width is too wide for somebody and they've got a lot of movements in their trunk and their hips, they're gonna move within it. I've certainly seen as Alex has nicely described, getting a nice snug fit for someone and that sensory feedback um, 
and that support and can see a really dampening in someone's movement. Um, seat length. Where once someone sat in a chair, where is their bottom compared to the back of the chair? Can someone get their bottom fully back? And actually don't just think about the bottom, but actually where um, the, your knees are, is there adequate length on the chair to fully support your legs? Um, and it's it was really important to look at, is there enough support, but actually is there too much support? I don't know if anyone else has sat in a chair and the length is too long. You, without realizing what you're doing, you're sliding forward. You, you yourself are going into a, um, a pelvic tilt to get comfortable because it's not comfortable if the seat length is too, is too short, um, too long too short and I get fatigued really quickly. Um, and the height as well. So when someone goes to sit down, um, is the chair at the back of their knees so it's the right height to sit down. So just getting that wrong will can lead to someone slipping and can lead to someone being uncomfortable. Could be as simple as that. Um, but then we start looking at, well, is the back angle right on the chair? Is it adjustable? Um, could be really careful with back angles because it changes the can change the angle of the pelvis and it can actually cause more problems <laughs> and less. So that's where you really want to be speaking to your OT and your physiotherapist or a seating rep who you know can give you that understanding and show the difference between um, backrests and tilt in space. Um, something that Alex and I have both experienced with HD, when we're talking about um, the angle of the hips, actually to have someone's knees raised and decreasing that angle can help prevent someone sliding and actually they, um, sensory wise, they're more supported as well. So just sit into the chair. So you can do that by putting a wrapped cushion in or using tilt in space on a chair. Um, tilt in space is really helpful for someone who hasn't got the ability to maintain their posture with no support. That's when I would start considering tilt in space, along with a backrest that's got some support, either a nice cushioned winged backrest or some additional lateral supports. Um, headrest, if you are going to start using tilt in space, and you need a headrest so someone's head is supported. Um, I put armrests in trays. Arm rest, yeah, armrest, if someone is still um, transferring in and out of a chair, then they need, um, we need to consider something to actually physically hold on to to help push up. So think about what fabric um, is on the, on the armrests or a, a dining room chair. Does it have armrests on to help someone stand up? And it's thinking about the, the risk of um, career movements and hurting yourself and maintaining function. They come hand in hand, that risk assessment of maintaining function and managing risk. Um, I put a tray on there. Um, I was thinking about you going back to the basic principles of um, seating when um, you know if our arms are supported then we've got less weight going for our upper body so that could help someone sit upright um, and then type of seat cushion so as OTs we've we've caught we're taught when we think about seating is where our body weight is and when we're sat down 75% of our weight all of us our weight is going through our bottom and our thighs um, if our feet are flat on the floor, 19, nearly 20% of our weight is going through our feet. So you imagine if you take feet off the floor, that's only putting more weight through um, your bottom and your thighs. So we have to think about um, the type of seat cushion um, and think about someone's skin integrity, their movements, their continence weight and um, being underweight or frail skin you know fragile skin all the things that we'd consider to get the seat cushion right on a chair 
oh, really simple things as well, like does that seat cushion actually velcro onto the chair? Is someone slipping because the cushion's not secure? There, there can be so many components to why, um, the first question, why someone's not comfortable in terms of the actual chair and what's on the chair. I'm very conscious of time. Yep. Um, really, we've just got some photos now of different chairs, but we are talking about Huntington's disease. So do consider the robustness of the chair. Um, as Alex has said before, um, robustness in terms of its stability, but also it might not last for long um, due to the fabric type in someone's movements. Fabric type's really difficult because you want a fabric that's durable, um, but you want something which is going to offer pressure relief potentially. So you want something that's breathable. So there's lots of things to consider. Um, we put padding on there um, to help um, prevent damage from career movements, but actually as someone's becoming more fragile as well, you want a nice supported padding, um, padded chair. Um, and thinking about accessories, so for someone who's sliding in a chair, um, a pelvic belt can be used to support posture. Not to keep someone in a chair in terms of prevent them moving, moving out, but actually to support the pelvis, keep their hips secure back in the chair to prevent um, sliding. I have used groin harnesses. Um, with tilt and space again to keep someone's pelvis secure to stop them sliding. If you are putting a belt on, the individual must be able to release it so they can get out of the chair, otherwise it's a form of restraints. And if someone is unable to undo that belt because they physically can't, then we need to make sure that they're in agreement. They understand why the belt's in place. And if they don't understand, then we need to be putting a belt on and talk, doing that in their best interests. So then we need to have that conversation with family or staff members. Um, and same with groin harnesses as well. And the chest harness, the chest harness. Um, I would never use a chest harness without making sure the, the pelvis is secure. So you're probably looking at using that harness with a pelvic belt. Um, I've found chest harnesses really useful um, for specific reasons, such as at meal times or going out in the community when there's a real risk of someone going forward and the care is not being able to, to um, stop that at, the, at that time um, and I've put foot support in there as well so we've just said that 19% of our weight goes through our feet so imagine you're sat on a chair yourself that's too tall for you and your feet aren't on the floor you're going to fatigue much quicker than you would with your feet um, your feet supported you're going to start feeling the pressure going through your bottom but you can change your posture you can move not everyone with Huntington's disease can move, or they might not get that feedback. I'm getting pins and needles now where I've got my legs crossed, so I'm going to readjust again because I'm getting that sensory feedback. I've just put my bottom back in the chair because I'm not as comfortable as I was. I can do that. Um, we have to consider with someone with Huntington's disease that they can't do that or they can't tell us. Anything to add, Alex? I'm just putting... No, not at all, because you've got a couple of minutes left. So yeah, some photos up now of <laughs> chairs that um, I've used, that Alex has moved. So the seating matters, the chair that we saw um, earlier with the, the lady in um, is an Atlanta chair. And there's a really nice um, blog on their um, website about why they've used that for that person. Um, and there's a care, Careflex chairs. They're the chairs that um from the manufacturers won't come with four breaks on each of the casters so i always ask that to be added as an extra i don't think that changes the price but i wouldn't ever order that without having all the looking casters on there and there's an amiga chair and the last slide is just additional accessories so for the the questions on making my husband comfortable if he is sliding lock and glide sheets can be tried 
and we've talked about them before. So they help prevent someone from sliding forward. So they lock, so you can't slide forwards, but actually if someone has shifted, you can glide back, but they don't work with everyone. There's a few things to consider with using those. Um, and then slide sheets as well, which you can use in seating um, to help reposition somebody. And thank you, we've done that in exactly an hour.